It'll be obnoxious. Okay. <laughs> welcome, welcome to For the Love of Literacy, Lois. Thanks for joining me today. How are you? I am doing really well. Thank you very much. Great. Would you take a minute to introduce yourself to everybody? I am Lois Litchford. I am the author of the book Reverse to Memoir. I'm a literacy problem solver and I'm the co-founder of Teaching Students with Dyslexia. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know, I did not know that you had helped co-found that. So I'm gonna write it down so I remember. Um, I was really excited about your memoir because I'm also a writer, but we have lots to talk about. Okay. Well, so. your, your podcast name for the love of literature, literacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. What I've been in this business a long time. What the research tells us, jumping in the deep end, is that the children who struggle the most receive the most reductive instruction, the most work on letters and sounds, and they fail to get the love of literacy. That is very true. That is part of why we are here. Um, I, I did teach school back in the day. I was a fourth grade teacher. Uh, I stopped teaching to be a full-time stay-at-home mom and then have turned into a writer and podcaster in the mix. So I, but I do, I'm very familiar with, even though I was a fourth grade teacher, I'm very familiar with the issues um, faced in our classrooms today. Even in fourth grade, there are many kids that instead of learning to read, sorry, excuse me, reading to learn, they were still learning to read and they were dyslexic or had other reading or learning disabilities that hadn't been caught onto before fourth grade. And they're nine and 10 at that age. Yes. So that should never happen, in my opinion, uh, regardless of how many times the family may have moved or, you know, if they've slipped through the cracks. And I know teachers are busy and have a big classroom. I know that I always had 32 kids at least. However, for a student to get to fourth grade and not have been, you know, given the proper pullouts or interventions is just sad. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about your son as well, because I know that kind of gives you your, your experience, your background here. Yeah. Tell us yes. a little bit about your story with him. What was his official diagnosis when he was younger? How did it impact you? Did you end up homeschooling? All of that good stuff. In 1994, I sent my son to school. He was five and a half years old. We were in Brisbane, Australia at the school district, the school to go to in the whole state, right next to the university. Oh, wow. Uh, I sent him to school. He was worried. He wet his pants. He bit his fingernails. And when he goes to school, he stares into space. He can't take in the information from the teacher and he just withdrew. What I didn't know was the teacher shouted at him every day and he was alienated. He sat by himself every day throughout that year and no one contacted me. Oh, my goodness. I can't even talk about it, really, because it is really now, you know, so distressing about what they did and allowed to happen to this child. And you have to ask why. Mm -hmm. We'll do the testing. The testing comes at the end of year one. He can read 10 words. You should have a thousand. He can read 10 words. He's got no strength and he's got a low IQ. Why didn't anyone contact me? Because your child's not very smart. <laughs> and you're sitting here going, that is not the only reason that you contact a parent. In fact, if there's an issue, you contact the parent. How I wish now as a mother, I had removed my son and done something totally different. I didn't remove him because I had a two and a half year old at home. And I knew if Nicholas was at home with me, I wouldn't be able to teach him, he wouldn't work. And then I'd go back to school and the school would say to me, your child is failing because you didn't do the work. If you'd left him with us, it would have been fine. You know, so it yeah. becomes compounding issues. The official diagnosis at the end of first grade is specific learning disability, right? My husband's a professor and we have the opportunity to remove him from school for six months in the second half of 1995. We do it. We go to Oxford, England, and I take a series of books with me called Success for All, and I fail. 
because we've got isolated words on a page. He's to, you know, decode the word, put the word into a picture, do something with it. He couldn't do it. There was, you get to the end of the page and you're back at the beginning and he's no clue. My mother-in-law was with me saying, Lois, and she said, Lois, put away what's not working and make learning fun. I then thought, what do I, what do I have to do? What can he do? Panic, panic, panic. I started to write simple poems, the simplest of poems, rhyming words. I read them to him. We found the rhyming words. We talked about the poem he illustrated. Oh, cute. And then one person spoke to me and she gave me the series of books here at Sea at Sayadu to help him with decoding. It took us eight weeks to go through the consonant, the consonant digraphs, TH, CH, and SH, with short vowels only to learn that. He understood. Between those two things, learning transformed. It was fun. It was sticking. Yes. And learning went from just being in our classroom to the city because then we started to look at maps and mapping and, and that became a whole thing. But Nicola started to love learning and instead of seeing a dumb kid, I'm starting to see a child with a brain. I did the poem with double O's on cook, look and book and not just cooking and looking. I wrote a poem about Captain Cook, the last of the great explorers. Oh, and while we're doing that, Nicola said to me, who came before Captain Cook? And I said, well, that's easy. That was Christopher Columbus. <laughs> and then he said to me, and who came before Columbus? And the moment he asked that question, I knew I'm not dealing with a child with a low IQ. Yeah. I needed that. I needed to see him in a different light because his learning of letters and sounds is at a snail's pace. But his thinking was right way off this planet. So that dichotomy remains today. But that was the start. I returned to school and put Nicholas back in the classroom. Nicholas's classroom teachers were unbelievably fantastic. Good. Fantastic. Meet the diagnostician who'd done the testing. And I said, well, Nicholas has learned so much. She stood up. She looked at me and she said, well, I've spoken to the reading teacher and he's gone backwards. And in fact, he's the worst child I've seen in 20 years of teaching. Who even says that to a parent? Oh, my word. We were, you know, you might think we were in 1895, not 1995. <laughs> but here we were in 1995 when we know literacy is absolutely critical. Right. And that was the start of it because once she gave me that label, I returned to school and I said, you can call him whatever you like but don't expect him to learn like everybody else. And that is, I mean, that was obviously the crux of the issue from the beginning. He just wasn't being seen. Yeah, he wasn't being evaluated properly, which is so frustrating, especially just because, and I'm in the US, but I must say I'm of Australia, I just absolutely adore your accent. And I love many authors and illustrators from Australia and I still need to visit the continent. However, because- However, I live now in Australia. I live in upstate New York, but our journey is intercontinental. We moved to the UK. We moved to Australia. We lived in Lubbock, Texas from 1999 to 2007, and Nicholas went from the bottom to the top in that state. Wow. That's awesome. And, I, you know, it's just hard because they do. I'm not sure exactly the protocol out of the U.S., but as a teacher here, I know there's a lot of testing especially in kindergarten, where they're supposed to catch things like that. Letter recognition, you know, phonics, phonemic awareness, um, sentence structure, the sounds. I, I'm sure just even talking about it makes you go crazy. But that is typically protocol. So I'm just appalled that, that you guys experienced that, that you went through that because it's awful. And no child ever, 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 I just talked about this in my last podcast, should hear any kind of a label like that they are dumb or if they're struggling or a reluctant reader, they should not hear that word because that will turn them off from reading immediately. From everything. Yep. 
And like you said, IQ can be like, like top notch. They're just learning differently with reading. It's just reading actually does have to be taught. It's a skill. It is a skill. We usually get an acceptable label in Lubbock, Texas, and it's second percentile speech language impaired. Today, they would say developmental language disorder. disorder. Right. And what that means is his ability to remember isolated words and sounds places him in the lowest percentiles possible. Wow. Shows how critical the teaching was for him. Oh, yeah. No, very critical. And I think it kind of points this out. My next question was, what do you feel like some common misconceptions of reading disabilities and dyslexia are? What, like either as teachers or parents, like what are some common misconceptions around that topic? That all we have to do is teach decoding. That's number one. Right. That in fact, dyslexia is a language disorder. It's an inability to connect the oral language and the written language. Okay, adding to my story and my complexity, I grew up reading words. I could not comprehend. So when I read academic literature, I'm looking at it from the point of view of my son and myself. Many people think all you have to do is teach decoding. And if you teach decoding, we'll get there. The words with multiple meanings start the moment you learn to read. The mm -hmm. word two and the word four. They must make sense. Inference happens within the first, whatever you do, you can create inference. Our children don't get it. And this fascinating little clip from Nicholas talking about the word saw, uh, where he says, I expected one word to have one meaning because that's logical. There's you no can't argue with that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. And that the learning to read at age five or six is founded on a child having adequate oral language background skills. And when they struggle with reading, they will all often, not always, often struggle with oral language, concepts of past, present, and future tense. They are often taught in speech therapy. Understanding why you use the ED on words and how that is different from the present tense to the past tense. Right. The way we teach those words is critical. And the way we teach them and throwing them out to kids as a sight word with no foundation, no bed, no nest for the word, you've got to get it. And you've got to get it the way I teach it, or you don't understand it. You're, there's a problem with you. It's the biggest problem. Right. Because that, I mean, and English is a very, fairly difficult language to learn on the lexical, you know, in the lexile measurement of things. It is. Yes. And yes. there are so many little rules yes. and other little things that we just take for granted. So, and I, I can say this because I taught Spanish for a little while. Um, I learned to speak it and then I taught it and taught the grammar. And I was like, oh my gosh, I really have an appreciation for the fact that I speak English because these, when I'm trying to explain it in Spanish, these are rules that don't make sense to me. They don't even make sense to me. I just grew up hearing it and learned it that way. And that's that. And my, and my brain, you know, connected it. Not everyone's brain works that way. And as we've discussed, that's the problem. That's the problem is assuming that all students, all children come to you with the same, like, yeah, across the board, same level. Yes. Wouldn't that be so boring <laughs> if, if it all came to us that way? <laughs> I can tell you what happened to my son now. When he was age eight to 18 months, he had ear infections. Oh. Ear infections impact the brain and the brain growth. And if you're not hearing language, you then can't speak it and it, it changes the neurons in the brain that are being accessed. Right. On top of the fact that I'm his mother, I'm dyslexic. And the, you know, that compounding component is the ear infections. That's what really, you know, the lot through him. And because his then oral language and comprehension of oral language was challenging, that's what really made school incredibly difficult for him. 
Oh yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, because you have to be able to hear sounds to repeat yeah. sounds and to process sounds. And what we were saying before, words like word, W-E-R-E and W-H-E-R-E, they sound the same. Or, you know, and there's a subtle difference between each one of them. And children don't pick that up and don't understand the difference in the meaning of those words. Well, and you have to think about, like you said, so that, you know, there's all different kind or all different types of personality, learning personalities. You've got aural learners, you've got yeah. visual aural, you've got auditory, you've got kinesthetic. I mean, you've got a music, musical, you've got a plethora of different learning personalities and you're cramming them all into one classroom. Okay. That, and that, and I, and I say this not bitterly, I was a teacher. I know the challenge there. But I was also an exception because I had gifted and twice exceptional students in my classroom. I had been certified for that, but I still got some of the lowest readers and most challenged kids in the school. And when that happened, I didn't go, oh, you know, poor me. I said, let's assess this kiddo. I think we need to help them out because I can tell that they are just lost in class. That's not fair to them. I don't want to put them in an uncomfortable place. I'm going to talk to the parents. I'm going to talk to the academic board. And I got busy whenever I saw it. And I saw it a handful of times. Yeah. But one year I had three kiddos and I would meet with one of them before school several times a week. He was dyslexic. He had not received any help. We were working on an IEP for him, but good grief. It takes forever to get those things ironed out. And I was like, we're going to start right now because you we are not being fair to you trying to hold you on this level when you're hearing things and you're getting overwhelmed because your classmates are here and you're here trying to understand and comprehend. Yeah. You know, I had to read his tests out loud to him. So he actually was pretty strong orally, but that's, and that's exceptional. So it just depends on the kiddo, but I get so fired up talking about it because again, this, these are nine and 10 year olds. So they have yeah. gone years without being detected or properly assessed. And then they get into a grade where they're really starting. Sure. High school and college don't look at your, you know, elementary school grade card or report card, but kids remember, you know, and labels and things like that stick with them. We have to, at that very beginning point, when they are so young, notice these things, you know? And so it's so fortuitous for Nicholas that you were his mother because anyone else may not have picked up on it and would have just kept pushing, you know, and said, no, you need to go. School's good for you. Maybe, you know, some parents I've had this problem where I'm like, oh, maybe my son is performing differently for me. He's in preschool, but I'm like, maybe he'll read better for his preschool teacher. And then I realized, no, the problem is I was pushing him to read before he recognized all the sounds of the letters in the alphabet. That's the problem. And many of the times we educators tend to do that. We push ahead because you know there's this protocol and there are all these rules to follow but we're not seeing the child and we're not seeing the need you know and so then we have to get outside help or interventions because we didn't pick up on it I don't know where to start <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know because the first thing I wanted to say is Nicholas is second grade teacher was wonderful but the teacher he loved the absolute most in his school was a third grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Raspaskowski. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's and memorable. What, and what she did, she was Sicilian, I think, or Crete, one of those islands. Okay. What she did was she said, I read a chapter of the book every day, you know, and it'd be a Roald Dahl. And I particularly remember they were reading the, the BFG. Oh, yeah. I only read one chapter and then we stopped. And they pester me all day. <laughs> no, no. And she's building up, building up for the next day. And that was so powerful. Everything she did, Nicholas just fell in love with. She had children learn a poem, learn and recite a poem. Nicholas can do that. Every child can do that. And in fact, he learned something that was harder than many other children would learn. I mean, just the things he did. He was accepted in her classroom. And I think that was critical. And she did activities that were across the board, not just for a group. 
Oh, and those teachers, man, they know they have that appeal. The book that my students were always begging for was the Mysterious Benedict Society. I got them hooked <laughs> on that. And so each day after lunch, that was our thing all together. You know, it was no student, no student reading. It was me reading to them, <laughs> doing yes. all the voices and all the things. Yes. So it was so fun that Disney came out with that TV show this year. I was like, oh, I need to have a watch party with my former fourth graders. It was you fantastic. You've just said it. You know, you did all the voices. You had every child in that class in your paw. <laughs> yes. And then begging, begging. If we get if we get our planners done early, can we read one more chapter? And that's yes, the yes, best. Yes. That's the best feeling. It really is. Because yes. then it's like they're begging to read. Yes. Let's have a readathon. Let's reward your good behavior. Everyone bring your favorite books and snacks. And man, I mean, I never felt like we had enough time to read, but honestly. It, I, the, as I think you said your mom had mentioned, like, it's so important to make learning fun, right. to make reading enjoyable. And that really is the ticket. If you can do that, you're yeah. going to have students that struggle. You're going to have students that don't maybe take to reading like the others. But as I talked about earlier on this season with um, Sarah, Sarah Marie, she talked a lot about how kids just haven't found the right book or the right genre. And as a teacher, as a parent, it is our responsibility to help them find that. It breaks my heart to think someone just wouldn't like, would give up on reading because they never found the right book. Or the right teacher. Or the right teacher. <laughs> what, I, what I do, my big thing, and this comes a lot, I think, from my background as well, is that I take a book or a text or a short story, something that's been published, and turn it into a play. Oh, very fun. Yes. And again, for the children who struggle the most, you're taking away all of the description. Now, this is my background. I think description kills me. And I couldn't, I can read the words and just get lost in the description. But once I get to a dialogue, I'm understanding, da 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 da. You've got a backwards and forwards. And that takes away the pain and that gets you caught up in the story so that then you can go back and then read the description with with confidence definitely and, and that was a that's my in to the most vulnerable students because again they've had letters and sounds and letters and sounds and students came to me at age 16 non-reading couldn't read 10 words <sighs> how do you do it and that was to find a text that they loved and they could connect with and say yes I'm in this one and this is worth my while Oh, and that's the absolute best. Better late than never. Better late than never. I mean, really. So tell me, why did you decide to write about your experience? I'm so glad you did. Why did you decide to write about it? And had you written anything before? Was this your first thing? Oh, boy. <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> yes, I, my husband is an academic and I have followed him around the world and I've picked up reading jobs after he's got his whatever job he's doing. He moved to upstate New York, which is where we are now. I cannot teach up here. I don't have the nice credentials. I taught in Texas, I taught in Australia, but I cannot teach in upstate New York. So I went back and did my master's degree at SUNY Albany. Okay. Uh, Donna Scanlon, that was fantastic. And I did the reading there and loved what I did that. Finished that and thought, what else do I do? What do I want to do? At this time, Nicholas is on a scholarship to do a PhD in applied mathematics from Oxford University. Wow, that is impressive. Wow. How incredible. See his IQ though, it was solid and you knew that. Yeah, the language problem really brings it down. And because his story was getting better and better and better, I thought, I want to write this. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm dyslexic. So Every up for the challenge. <laughs> Everything, you, you know, the problems happen is that not only do you lack writing, you lack practice, you lack exposure. However, I started to write, and it's a mess, but I ended up going to writing classes. And while I'm at writing classes, I meet this wonderful girl who's the same age as my son 
And she said, Lois, I'll help you write it. And she worked with me for a year. I wrote, she edited, I wrote, come back, edit. And it made a book that someone said to me yesterday, Lois, I just couldn't put it down. I wanted to turn the page as you went along this journey. That was, that's my story. But Nicholas's story really depended on living on various continents. If we had stayed in one place, he would not be where he is today. Why? Mindset. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about mindset. I want to unpack that a little bit because the growth versus the fixed mindset is just crucial. Phenomenal. Yes. And especially in this context, but in learning in general, in learning and growing, growth mindset is huge. Why is it so powerful? We left Brisbane, Australia in 1999. Nicholas is in fifth grade. He's reading on a third grade reading level and reading 20 minutes a night. Everybody's happy. Why? He's exceeded expectations. Oh, we didn't expect him to read all right, and he's doing all these things. Oh, isn't that fantastic? We moved to Lubbock, Texas, this place that's as brown and flat and boring as possible. <laughs> Not very scenic, yeah. <laughs> and nine things I identified happened in that school, in that district, that would not have happened in Brisbane, Australia. The first was going to school and the teacher principal saying, we've got an AR program, Accelerator Reader Program. And Nicholas came home and he said, Mum, I've got to read a book and take a test. At 7 o'clock that night, Nicholas went to his bedroom and until nine o'clock and at nine o'clock I'm knocking on his door saying Nicholas it's time to go to bed I've got school tomorrow Nicholas read for two hours a night six and seven nights a week to read one goosebumps book oh my goodness the discipline and the drive to succeed was unbelievable yeah internal and that came not because anything special was done for Nicholas but this is the setup and Nicholas built in, drew into it. That was the first. And when you're reading at such a slow, slow rate, your improvement can only still be at a snail's pace. Lubbock, Texas is hours of drive from anywhere. What do you do? The library's full of books on CD. Every time we drove, Nicholas is listening. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Get those audio books in. Is it audiobooks? Listening, listening. And he's now hearing at the same rate of his peers. How did he go from the bottom to the top? They were two of the main things. And anybody, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And once we started listening and you're hearing, it goes back to reading. Because people think it's cheating. It's not. It gives you the arc of the story. It gives you the main characters. It gives you the problem that they're going to solve. And then when you go back to read it, you still have to read every sentence of every paragraph and make sense of it. Yeah. No, I actually, I mean, I would say, I know I, um, one of my favorite librarians of all time, Jansen Bradshaw, who's on Instagram, Everyday Reading, her blog literally talks about the power of audiobooks. She's always talking about audiobooks. And I consider her a very intelligent person. And she'll always talk about audible deals. She'll talk about how her kid that struggled with reading did very well with audiobooks. And if, and if I recall correctly, kids can listen above their comprehension level, at least until seventh grade. So that's a, a substantial amount of time for them to be building that comprehension. Plus their brains are just so malleable the younger they are, you know, and for them to learn, you know, I've done podcasts with my son. Um, he loves being read to, but I've done just little stories, podcasts. Our drive to the library isn't quite as long as yours, but he loves, loves, loves podcasts. Sister, not so much. She would rather have a book and be flipping through it. She's my visual learner. She would rather have a book. She, she will listen to the book if she can look through it. Otherwise, she wants to do her own thing. So it's hard with two kiddos in the back. Very different, different things. Yes. Wanting to do different things. Yeah. But it's also the hearing the language of their right. peers. Right. The language that just explodes. Mm -hmm. it, it's not sequential. It's a, it's a, um, it's not, a, it's multiplication. What's the word? Pardon? 
exponential. Exponential, yes. You know, it's a volca it's volcanic, and that's what they need. And if we, that's the problem. If we're stuck still teaching them letters and sounds, because that is sequential. Right. That's, that's and so they need both. They need both, and they have to be exposed to both, and we have to give them both. I agree. I think I mean, as a kid, my struggle was mathematics. And I made it in college and university a focal point because I knew I was going to be teaching children math. And I got to be such a good actress that I had students who thought math was my favorite subject. <laughs> and I said, oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. It's completely language arts. But I learned because I had a few, a handful of teachers who got me, who saw me at my level, understood that I approached problems in a unique way. They didn't dismiss me as dumb. They just showed me there was more than one way to get the answer. And so I took that approach as a teacher. I said, show your work. And if I can see that you got the right answer, you're on the right path. And so it's a little bit harder, of course, with language arts and literacy, because, you know, being able to produce, so writing the, the, that part of literacy, maybe they're strong writers, but they're not strong readers, or they're really good readers, fluent readers, but they're not comprehending. There's all kinds of combinations Yes, make it a challenging yes. subject, you know, which is why drama is so critical, because every time you're reading a sentence or a character's part, you're doing more than just reading words. How would that character say that? And when you've got good readers doing it, you've got good readers modeling it for, for the those who are less skilled. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, that and, and hearing the peers language is huge. And it's all encompassing. That's why I love it so much. I, and they learn, you know, the love of it. There's a podcast or a person that, would, that is worth listening to, and it's Professor Pam Snow from Australia. And one I listened to her on talking to Jake Downey, I think, about okay. literacy and the importance. And she said, you know, she talked about a lot about the foundations of literacy because she's a speech-language pathologist. Oh, okay. And she said, children need to know why they're doing it. And it's not, you're going to do this because I'm telling you why. Right. But it's why we're we doing this because with Nicholas, I want to know about Captain Cook and Columbus and, 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 and the rest. And, yeah. And with my other students, I can see myself here. Oh, I want to do this. And, and. And that's what I think we sometimes forget in this whole debate, that the child needs to see that. It's not us, but the child needs to come for their own reason. Why am I doing this? It's not sufficient because I've given it to you. Right. And if we think about it, really, there are very few children ever satisfied by the answer because I said so. You know, be authoritarian, <laughs> shut, shut it down for discussion, you know. Talk about not giving a child a chance to explore and learn. I mean, it's just like, and I've never really liked that response. So I don't, I don't yes. recall a time I've said it to my children because that's not a good reason. Like you said, they need to know, they need to be able to rationalize and logically put together. Why am I doing this? What purpose does it fulfill? Whether it's what I want to be when I grow up, whether it's the fact that I just want to get to the same level as my other peers. I want to be in this community. I want to be on this level. I want to have a certain, you know, approach. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just going for this career or this job, but or maybe I want to try out for drama. Maybe I want to be on the debate team. So whatever it is, yes, give them a purpose, give them a motive because that will help those struggling or reluctant readers who are very often mislabeled anyway, because yes. their issues are not seen. For yes. what they are. Yeah. And they're often seen like me. Well, they're just not smart enough. You know, you talk about mindset. When I deal with these children who are so slow, my saying is instead of seeing them as learning disabled, we need to see them as future rocket scientists. Oh, I love it. Yes. I love it because that's what my son wants. He wants to work at NASA. He told his preschool teacher, I will work on rockets for NASA. I want to be an engineer and I love it. And I've said to him, I, you know, I said, and that's perfect. I said, for everything that you do, 
you will need to learn how to read and write, but I know that you love math and engineering more, you know, and I respect that. Just know that you need to have, you know, be well balanced, whatever you end up choosing to do. But yes, oh my goodness, the untapped potential in the people who run NASA or these, you know, the rock and they really, oh my gosh. I mean, I just, I just um, read the hidden figures myself and then read the picture book with my kids. And then when I watched it, I was like, those women, they were computers. They were literally just geniuses and not even recognized for what they contributed. I mean, I'm just blown away by it. Yes. And you know, the one woman who wanted to be an engineer, wanted to be an engineer and she had to fight to go to school. Yeah. With, with kids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the only boggling. Yeah. And a black woman at that. Oh my. Things are different. You know, we have to recognize that. And some people do have this enormous strength in language and others have this huge strength in, in mathematics. You know, and, and it all begins at the beginning. You, there's no jumping, big jumps. You've got to right. start at the beginning. You've got to build foundational knowledge at every level. And that's, yeah, that's the part that's critical, building that foundational knowledge and building it in a way that is engaging. Because what the other thing that happened in Lubbock, Texas, was Nicholas got a connect set for his 11th birthday. He didn't get one big one. He got two. Mm-hmm. And he was built and built and built with connects and became a star of the school. And his connects buildings, he built the Eiffel Tower, Sydney Harbour Bridge, St Paul's Cathedral, and they were shown around the city. And it's also mathematical knowledge that he's learning about as he's learning in school. Oh, this building works on da 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 and he can tell me things that, I mean, I don't know about. <laughs> I mean, that's just incredible. And what I think too, is the other day I was, you know, I'd been doing some research to talk about how to help reluctant readers who become that way more because they weren't encouraged properly a lot of the time. But one of the thing, one of the tips is to, to accentuate their strengths, let them be good at what they're good at, and then try to teach them, build on that. He loves architecture, find things to read that are, you know, dealing with architecture. I mean, it's, it sounds so basic, but I think a lot of times we overlook that in our, in our eagerness to like push the next thing at them. No, you need to learn the ABCs. No, you need to know, you know, this concept. And, oh, I forgot to let you check out books about rockets last time we were at the library. Shame on me, you know? And that, that learning is, is not sequential. No, it's not just learning letters and sounds but it comes from multiple multiple wherever multiple angles right. as you're talking then I realized what I've done recently which I'd forgotten about I'm a published author in the reading teacher oh my goodness that is so cool because I've struggled with uh, writing I I reached out to some professors and I reached out to Professor Tim Rosinski. He's an emeritus professor and said, would you help me publish this paper? And he said, he read it and he said, this is, this should go in the reading teacher. And so it was published, I think in July, I forget the date, but what made me think of it was that it's about pronouns. He, she, they, them, it. Mm -hmm. Many of my students can read the word and not identify the its appropriate antecedent. And it's something as simple as saying, well, who is the he in this text? Because in a book like Dear Zoo, do you know Dear Zoo Zoo by Rod Campbell? Yes, I love that book. The he on every page is the same the way you decode it. The meaning changes. Same with the word him. I sent him back. Mm -hmm. He was too fierce. He was too tall. I sent him back. And it's not just simply, again, going back to reading words. It goes back to comprehension as you read the words. Right. Oh, my goodness. No, that's actually still a very favorite because even though we have it in baby book 
board form. Um, my kids love the flaps and it does, it, just, it reinforces that the pronouns, which if you think about it, as kids grow up and the language becomes more complex and you expect their writing to become more complex, the simplest confusion happens between saying their name. You know, Kai did this, he played on the lacrosse team and they won and going back and forth between he, they, we, me, it just suddenly gets very confusing, overwhelming. So I'll have to look up your article because I'm sure, I'm sure I will be enlightened and entertained because it will remind me of the days of trying to really stress that in the, in the classroom. <laughs> well, I am just, I'm just so thankful that someone was willing to put up with me and, you know, work with me to do it. Cause I don't, you know, I struggle with rereading things, rereading what I've written. Right. I don't see, it. I don't see my errors. And then I have to have read, please read it to me or, you know, something, read it. To, and it just gets frustrating and it takes a long time. Yeah. Oh, no. And I even though I love writing, you know, I've, I've actually always wanted to be a writer. Um, I am the same way where I have to have someone else look at it. I have to read it out loud sometimes from the print to catch something. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't occur to me just reading it quietly to myself. Yes. Oh, I shouldn't have said it that way, or that sounds wrong. You know, even my podcast scripts, I mean, there's so many errors because I just write out basic questions and then I'm like, that wasn't even the right, you know, tense or the right grammar, you know, context. What was I going to say there? So, I mean, it, and it is writing is a process writing and writing and reading both are processes. And I feel like this would be really valuable coming from you with all of your background. What advice would you give to people who are interested in writing, but it maybe doesn't come naturally for them? What advice would you give them? Lots. Okay. First, go to a writing class is one. Mm -hmm. Go to a writing class with someone that you, there's a small enough number for you to write and have it critiqued. That's number one. Number two, get mentor texts. Use mentor text. What's a mentor text? It's a text that you love or a book that you read that you say, wow, this sentence blows me away. This paragraph blows me away. And then you look at why does it do it? What intrigued you about the way the author said that? That's huge. And then start writing in that style. How can I do this? How can I use that skill in my writing? And number three, read a lot. <laughs> yeah. Write a lot. Read a lot, write a lot. I agree with you. I think a lot of my inspiration in general has come from reading. I'll be reading something or, and maybe not right then, but later on in the evening, I think, oh, that would make a really good children's book. I should write that, that, that idea down that I got from when I was reading earlier. I always love it when I'm reading two different, I, I'm crazy. I read more than two books at the same time. I'm often reading four or five and yes. not all fiction, you know, some are self-help, yes. some are nonfiction or biography, but I'll always mm -hmm. find something that connects randomly between the books. And I love it. And then it'll give me an idea and fuel something else. So like, that's huge. But I also, I have to second what you said about a writing class. I looked one up just through our online here, you know, virtually and uh, we didn't have the funds for it. I was trying to, to get the money to um, invest in my book that I was writing. And so I did some, I did some other things. I hired editors at ReadZ. I did other, you know, uh, little courses through Udemy and things. And I was like, after I published my first children's book, any, any profit, if I do make some, will go towards that writing course. I really want to take one. I think yes. that's huge. Yes, I do too. And you learn how to critique. I've become, I've become a better reader because I'm a writer and I can read books now and look at these bestsellers and think, how did that get there? Sorry, right. this is appalling. One book I read, it's thousands of reviews on Goodreads. The first chapter was 70 pages. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'm reading, thinking, how much longer? <laughs> yeah, when do I get to the end of this? <laughs> and the book 
didn't, it needed a better editor. It didn't have the arc of the story that you need from the beginning of a chapter to the end of a chapter. Right. Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, if you, if you can even pick up on that, just as the reader, not an editor, then obviously that was yeah, a step that maybe got skipped. And that was kind of why I didn't want to self-publish completely because I feel like I still have so much to learn that I needed and you know, I needed some more know-how I needed some more background and in marketing too. I don't know how to market my own book. I mean, I think that's incredibly challenging. <laughs> it is. It is. And I I would say I've done it all in the wrong order and whatever. But anyway, I've done it. I've published it. Are you self-published? Is it self I'm hybrid published. Hybrid. Okay. That's what I'm doing as well this time. Yes. What I found with the editor was fascinating because I sent my book to an editor, my draft to an editor. And within 24 hours, she got back to me with edits. And her edits made me go, oh. And I thought, okay, so I put it on some site that give other people will edit it. And I sent it out and yes, edit my work. Will you edit these first two pages? I want to see what you do. Not one of those people came back with anything like this first person. And that's the lady I went with for editing. And she transformed my book, really transformed it. In fact, I had three editors. You know, my first one was the young girl who was here. She was working at the diamond mine. Oh, wow. <laughs> it out of the, you know, really digging it out of the mine in the dark. Yeah. The second one cut it. And she really cut it to a point where it was great. And then I had a third editor who polished it. And so then I felt after three sets of professional eyes on it, I know I have a book that's now worthwhile reading. Right. And it is such a process. It's hard, at least for me, to not feel a little offended at first when I saw how much the first editor wanted to cut out and then the publishing company editor wanted to cut out because I was like, well, I know it's a picture book, but I want these sentiments in there. How do we do this in fewer words? I'm just a, I'm a woman of many words. This is hard for me. Do we make it an easy chapter or do we keep my vision of a picture book? It's just there's so many steps. It, I know you can empathize with that, but it really is, it kind of breaks you down a little bit in the process. But then, like you said, when, once it's finished, yeah. revised and polished, you're like, Hey, this is worth reading. People are going to buy this. Yes. People are going to read this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope they buy it. I hope they read it. Because, <laughs> you know, my story, my son's story in particular to me, Nicholas was like Helen Keller. He's a modern day Helen Keller because there were no expectations and he was so slow with learning to read and doing anything with language that it was actually incredibly hard to see his strengths in school, in early school. And the fact that he had phenomenal spatial awareness and was brilliant at puzzles is irrelevant when you're learning to read. So heartbreaking though. And, and the extraordinary set of circumstances that took him out of that hole still blow me away because it, the school's got all the power and they've got all the formal testing to say you are, you've got unrealistic expectations for your child. And that's a challenge. It is. No, it definitely is, especially because up until your child goes to school, you are the authority in your parent. And start, as the parent, you are the authority in your kid's life. And you yeah. feel like you know your kid pretty well. You, yeah. you know, you have a right to, to, to say that you do and you've been with them. So that, I'm, I mean, that's incredible. I'm really looking forward to reading your memoir. And uh, can I find it on Amazon? Where can we find it? You certainly can find it on Amazon. I've also done an audio book and I've read that look at you that's amazing it is amazing for someone who's dyslexic and struggles with their words and doesn't oh. put it together <laughs> that is awesome plus i love your accent so maybe i will go listen to the audiobook too the audiobook is an abridged version it's not okay. The complete version. okay but it still flows there's not a gap in it i took a whole section out to make it easier to read and right okay it's available on Amazon. The audiobook is available on my website. My website is loisletchford.com. And I've put on that 
some of the activities that I have used with my children who struggle with learning to read. That's invaluable. How big of you? That's really awesome. I've asked for payment for them because I got tired of just giving them away. <laughs> no kidding. Um, because it's, you know, once children understand those components of language, it gives them a really solid foundation for moving on. And they're fun. Hands on. I do a lot of hands on stuff. I think that's huge. At least I feel like, especially with my son, it may not be a gender thing, but my son loves hands-on learning. In fact, when we yes. wrap up here, we're going to go do uh, a little home volcano upstairs with baking soda and vinegar. So I've been promising him that for a bit. So um, no, I just really appreciate you coming on today, Lois. I am super uh, enlightened. Everyone that listens to this is going to be touched. I really hope that that just goes out on all channels because you have such a unique story. I mean, it, here's what I mean by that. You're willing to share your story. There are many that have struggled like this. There are not as many that have come forward to share it or to share their child's story. So thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. That's amazing. <laughs> I have your website here and the book, and I will put all that in today's show notes. Anything else you would like to add? I have a YouTube channel. Oh, okay. That's awesome. <laughs> This started after I, my son graduated with his PhD and I said, Nicholas, tell me what happened in grade one. My son cried and not a word emerged from his mouth. And that's when I realised the depth of the problem that had happened in first grade. And so I reached out to other people and titled it When Learning is Trauma. Some of the people we talk to are other dyslexic people who failed through school. An important one to listen to is talking to my sister, Lenore Hall, because she said, Lois, what you did for Nicholas was you changed the environment of his learning. And that's what had to happen to have him go from the bottom, to have him love learning and creating a safe space where he could learn. And in October, I think on October something or other, we're talking to a lady you may or may not know, a brain scientist, Dr. Mary Helen Imordano Yang. And she talks about the power of emotionally safe spaces and that when children are learning anything to access their memory, it needs to be, they need to have, be relaxed and happy. And the happiness goes into memory. And that makes sense. Some of our, I mean, some of our earliest memories are tied to very extreme emotions, whether it was extreme embarrassment or sadness or extreme happiness and joy. Um, because I feel like, yeah, the things that I remember from ages three and four, my very earliest memories tied to strong emotions. And how we, and when we can get that emotion and the learning together, which is what I did with Nicholas, because Nicholas, then I switched the story from what happened in first grade to what we did in Oxford. He said, he said his first was, I remember the poems that you wrote for me. You know, he's 30. We wrote them when he was seven. Mm -hmm. And he named the poems. And then he said to me, and the mapping, the mapping taught me to love learning and I never want to stop learning. Oh, that's the best. And it really is, it even brings up the, the importance of emotional intelligence, of being in tune with our emotions while we're learning and gaining yes. that IQ. Exactly. So that's Mary Helen Imordano Yang who's going to talk to us. She's also done TED Talks on this. So she's phenomenal. So I'm really just yeah. excited to share that power and the importance of that rather than just belting children down and say, you've got to learn it my way. Right, right. Because that's it doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. work. So is that, is your YouTube channel under your name? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And I don't know if you've seen my video. We did a video the day Nicholas graduated. And that's really quite phenomenal. That's very moving. I'll have to go watch it. Yeah. And since I'm pregnant and hormonal, I'm sure it'll make me cry. So it'll be great. <laughs> a good cry was needed today. <laughs> well, thank you. This is just wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoy my book, share it with others, read it. And there's so many takeaways from my point of view. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing all the things that you share. Yeah.
Yeah, and make learning fun. I will. I'll keep doing that. Thank you so much, Lois. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Okay, bye. bye.